Today we're going to do an in-depth review of the DeBayer Mineral B Pro Element Carbon Steel Frying Pan. Is this the best carbon steel skillet for your money? We're going to find out. Hi, and welcome to Uncle Scott's Kitchen. Today we're going to take a look at a DeBayer Mineral B Pro Carbon Steel Skillet. We're going to go through its features, we're going to compare it and contrast it to some other carbon steel skillets, including a regular DeBayer Mineral B. And then we're going to give it an initial clean, give it an initial seasoning, and then we're going to really put it through its paces. We're going to cook a lot of hopefully delicious food. We're going to do a high temp sear test with some ribeyes. We're going to have a high temp test with some hamburgers. We're going to brown a pork roast and finish it in the oven. We're going to fry some potatoes, some okra, and maybe some other veggies. We're going to fry some bacon and sausage. And we're going to wrap it all up with the proverbial fried egg or omelet test. Then after a quick visit to the old cardiologist, we're going to make sure the pan is cleaned and we're going to check in on its seasoning. See how the seasoning performs, see how it changes as we cook things. And then we're going to answer the question, is this the best carbon steel skillet you can buy? I don't know. Let's get started. Okay, the first thing we're going to do is open this thing up. I just had this delivered from Amazon. I think now is a good time to mention that I buy all these pans myself. When I do a review, it's a pan I've purchased with my own money. And I hope that kind of ensures that all my reviews and my opinions are genuine and unbiased. Also, now is a good time to say that I welcome feedback. So if you have questions or comments or opinions on these carbon steel skillets or the reviews, feel free to leave them underneath the review below. And I do my best to respond to each and every one of those. And also now might be a great time to go ahead and subscribe to the old channel. And here it is, the Bayer Mineral B Pro. First reaction is this thing is pretty darn heavy. It feels solid. Made in France. Now I've noticed that some of the mat for pans, some of the mat for carbon steel skillets, are actually made in Germany. These buyers are actually made in France. And there it is, the Mineral B Pro. Now I kind of feel like a kid on Christmas morning because I really love getting new pans. And I've had my eye on one of these Mineral B Pros for quite a while now. And I finally pulled the trigger, finally got one. Got the stainless steel handle. We're gonna talk about that more here in a minute. One of the main reasons I bought this pan. It's got a helper handle. This is the 32 centimeter width. Now, I don't know how wide 32 centimeters is, so I had to get online and convert that. So it's really about 12 and a half inches. So and right off the bat, it feels heavy. It feels very nice and sturdy and heavy. It's a good looking pan. Now this pan ships with a beeswax finish to protect the pan, protect the carbon steel from rusting between the time of manufacture and when it arrives at a destination at a consumer's house. I have to say the coating is not quite as thick as it was on some of my other pans, the Movial or my other Mineral B actually. And that's okay though because it, getting that beeswax off of there can be quite a chore. We'll clean it up here in just a minute. Now what makes this a pro model versus a regular DeBayer Mineral B? This is my regular DeBayer Mineral B. It's a dedicated omelet pan. The difference is the handle. This pan can only be used on the stove top because the handle has a coating. This pro model has a stainless steel handle. It's not coated. This can go in the oven. So I'm really interested to see how this pan performs in the oven. It's also got a helper handle. I like that. The handle it has little indentations for your fingers. Right off the bat, this is a heavy pan. Very sturdy. 
Okay, the next thing we're going to do is get this thing cleaned up, get the beeswax off the surface, and we're going to give it its initial seasoning. Okay, for the initial cleaning, I went out into the yard and poured a couple of kettles of boiling water over the pan to melt the beeswax off, then washed it thoroughly with soap and hot water. Okay, now it's time to give the pan a good initial seasoning. Now the instructions that come with the pan say to just clean it and heat oil up to its smoking point, wipe it out, and you're ready to go. I'm going to go beyond that just a little bit and use the directions that came with my mat for pan. Use kind of what I call the mat for method. And that is to take the skins of two potatoes and saute them in two thirds cups of salt and one third cup of oil. Now I'm not using any fancy oil. This is just Crisco vegetable oil. Nothing fancy here. So you saute those until they're brown, wipe the pan out with paper towels, and then do it a second time. And that gives you a good initial seasoning. It goes a little bit beyond what is required in the Debayer instructions, but I like to do a little bit extra for this first seasoning just to make sure I get any kind of manufacturing residue, any of that extra beeswax, get all that off there, and start with a great initial seasoning. So notice that after this initial seasoning with the potato peels, that the pan is not dark black, it's not dark brown, but it is starting to take on just a little bit of color. Now what I want people to realize, although this pan isn't dark yet, it is correctly seasoned and we can just go ahead and start cooking. We don't have to season this thing repeatedly. We don't have to turn it dark black now. We can just start cooking with it. Everything will be fine. Okay, the first cooking test, fried potatoes. I already had four potatoes peeled for the initial seasoning, so I decided to make some home fries. I cubed up some potatoes, soaked them for a little while, drained them, dried them really well, heated up some canola oil in the pan, and started to fry them. Now this isn't an overly difficult test to start with, and that's okay because really what I'm looking for here is to see how the pan heats up, maybe which eye I need to use it on, um, how hot does it cook? And of course I want to see that nothing sticks. And that's what I'm finding out is that I can shake the pan and the potatoes slide around. I'm not getting any sticking at all. So I like that. And they brown really well. Notice I'm using a metal utensil in the pan. I'm not worrying about it. The directions say you can use metal utensils. And the fries turned out delicious. And here's the pan after I've cooked in it one time. Remember how it looked after the initial seasoning, how there was not much color change yet? Now notice that there's definitely some darkening, some browning starting to happen on the sides. Also, we fried those potatoes for about 16 minutes. And there's not much at all. There's actually pretty much nothing stuck to the pan. This is gonna clean up without soap or water. I'll be able to just dump this grease out and wipe it out with paper towels and it'll be ready to go for the next batch. Okay, next up we're gonna cook some delicious hamburgers. Now this will be the first time I've gotten the pan up to a really high temperature. A nice sound. After about two minutes, the burgers release no sticking. They're about done. They release easily. And the burgers turned out great. Okay, so that's the third time I've cooked in the pan. We just seared four hamburgers. Notice how much coloration change there is to the seasoning. Also, there's some stuck on sticky bits in the bottom. Nothing too bad. And that doesn't mean there's anything wrong with the seasoning. That should actually be expected. Now, if this were a steak or a higher end piece of meat, these could be turned into a fawn for some sort of pan sauce. But for this, the way you clean this up is, while the pan is still hot, take about a quarter cup of hot water and just deglaze the pan. Everything should scrape right out. Dump this out. I've still not used any soap on this pan and only the one little quarter cup of hot water. I've not run it under the sink. So you can see that the seasoning is really starting to come in. The sides are all brown and it's starting to work its way across the bottom of the pan. 
Okay, for the fourth cooking test, I'm going to try the proverbial fried zucchini test. Now these zucchini are all breaded. They're relatively uniform in size. And what I hope these are going to tell me is if the pan has any major hot spots or not. Okay, I learned a little something here, and it illustrates why it's important to practice cooking. Even though I had the flame turned down, I did have the pan on one of my high power burners on the front of my stove. I thought the zucchini were browning a little too quickly, so I moved the pan to one of my medium burners on the back of the stove and cooked another batch and everything turned out great. Okay, here's the seasoning of the pan after the fourth and fifth times I've cooked in it. I cooked two batches of zucchini. You can definitely see more of the brown color coming in. And to clean up this zucchini mess, there's actually nothing stuck in the pan. So yet again, I am going to clean this with just paper towels. No soap and water. There we go. Okay, now for the cooking test I've really been looking forward to the most, the pork roast test. What we're going to do here is take a pork roast, brown it on the stove top, and then move the pan and the roast to the oven to finish cooking. Okay, to season this roast, I used a dry rub technique, which after being married for six years is a technique I'm unfortunately all too familiar with. So I rubbed this thing down with a blend of brown sugar and a bunch of spices. Then we took some string from the good old string pig. Sorry, string pig, I hope this was no one you knew. Tied him up, put him in a Ziploc, and let it rest in the refrigerator for a couple of hours to get ready to go. So what I'm looking for here is how the pan responds to high heat on the stovetop, how it browns a larger piece of meat. This isn't just a small hamburger, this is a big pork roast. I'm really interested to see how these stainless steel handles perform in an oven. Now because the rub had some brown sugar in it, it kind of darkened up pretty quickly, but I browned the roast for a couple of minutes on each side, including the ends. Next, I got out my handy oven meat thermometer. Now, side note here, I'm gonna hide this thing for my wife, just so she doesn't get any ideas next time I get the flu. So in goes the thermometer, and then I put everything in the oven. 325 degree oven, and I'm gonna cook it until the pork comes up to an internal temperature of 140 degrees. Now, this ended up taking right at 40 minutes. And here it is. It looks absolutely delicious. The seasoning on the outside was very tasty and flavorful. The meat wasn't dried out. It was nice and juicy. And I thought it turned out great. And importantly, the stainless steel handles performed very well in the oven. Now let's take a look at the seasoning. When you brown meat in these pans is when you really get a lot of color change. So we got a lot of color on the pan, but notice that even though it looks bad, this stuff is not stuck on that bad. Once again, we deglaze the pan with some hot water, wipe it out with paper towels, and it's good to go. Notice how the seasoning is changing, getting a lot of color, it's darkening up. Now we've actually got some black on the bottom of the pan. Okay, for the next cooking test, we're gonna stay in the swine family and cook up one of nature's most perfect foods, and that's some Jimmy Dean hot breakfast sausage. Now here's how you cook sausage in a carbon steel skillet. The most important thing is to start out with a cold pan. Don't heat your pan first. Put your sausage in the pan cold. Then put the pan on a burner, turn it down low, and wait for it to start sizzling. And what this does is allow the meat to render out a little bit of fat. And if you do that, then the sausage won't stick. So to reiterate, to cook sausage in carbon steel, start with a cold pan. Now notice I'm using a metal utensil, no big deal. Once these things start sizzling and release a little bit, you can flip them, they'll be non-stick. And unsurprisingly, they were delicious. And again, with the cleanup, we're just gonna deglaze with some hot water, no big deal. For the next cooking test, we're staying with the fatty, salty breakfast pork meats. We're gonna cook some bacon. And again, it's very similar to cooking sausage. To cook bacon in a carbon steel skillet without it sticking, start the bacon in a cold pan. 
This will allow the bacon to render out some fat. It will release and the bacon will be non-stick. Now, bacon is one of the worst offenders when it comes to leaving some sticky bits on the bottom of the pan. That should be expected. Again, we'll deglaze the pan with some hot water. Those sticky bits will come right out. But the bacon itself will be non-stick if you start it out in a cold pan. Now, I ended up cooking three pans full of bacon, and once you get to that second and third pan, you don't have to let it cool down. You can just go ahead and put the bacon in the hot bacon grease there, but there will be enough bacon grease in the pan to prevent the bacon from sticking. And hopefully, unsurprisingly, a plate of fresh cooked bacon is extremely delicious. Okay, we're really putting this Dubai or Mineral B Pro through its paces. We still have more cooking tests to go. Here's another one I've been looking forward to a lot, and that is a high temp sear test of a big, thick ribeye steak. And this steak, it's about 1.3 pounds. It's about $18. And I just wanted to cook a few other things first. If I screw up a potato or a zucchini, I'm out less than a dollar. But screwing up an $18 ribeye, well, you do that a time or two and you're starting to talk some real money. Not only are we going to sear this thing on the stovetop, but this steak is so thick it's almost like a small roast. So I'm going to sear it for a couple of minutes on each side and then I'm going to finish it in the oven again. And once again, having these stainless steel handles on this Pro Model skillet allows me to take the skillet from the stovetop and use it in the oven. I really like that. So I seasoned this steak with a little salt and pepper, let it rest for a while at room temperature, I got the pan searing hot, and in goes the steak. It's really hot. I'm getting a lot of smoke. This will put some great color on the pan. I sear it on both sides. In the oven it goes. Out it comes. So not only did the handles work well in the oven, here's an instance where I really like having that additional helper handle. It really does help. And this thing looks delicious. Okay, after cooking all that meat and deglazing the pan over and over with hot water, I wanted to go back and fry a vegetable. I think frying something in hot oil for a while will be good for the surface of the pan. I just want to make sure it's still cooking correctly, nothing's sticking. So I decided to fry some okra. Now I grew up in Alabama and fried okra was a staple of my family's diet. I'm taking my mom's recipe here. Now that I live in Utah, the toughest thing is finding the correct kind of cornmeal. You have to choose one Choose one where the grind is not too coarse. You don't want big particles of cornmeal becoming crunchy and affecting the texture of your okra. Go medium or lighter on the grind. Now what my mom does is simply take the raw okra and dredge it in cornmeal with some salt and pepper. That's all there is to it. Now raw okra is kind of like a Washington politician. It's naturally slimy. You don't have to have buttermilk, you don't need milk, you don't need an egg wash. That cornmeal will stick to the okra on its own. And I really like this. I think it makes for a better fried okra. You're not just tasting fried batter. The taste of the okra shines through. So I got the okra breaded up, heated up the pan, heated up the oil, put it in. And I'm happy to say everything is cooking fantastically, even after deglazing that pan so many times in a row. I can shake the pan and the okra moves around. I'm using a metal utensil, no big deal. And as someone who grew up eating this stuff can attest, this is genuinely delicious fried okra. The pan did a fantastic job. I ended up making a second pan of it and we quickly devoured it all. Delicious okra. Next up is the final showdown, eggs. Has there ever been a truer test of the cooking surface of a carbon steel pan than whether or not eggs are non-stick? And I gotta admit, I'm a little bit nervous. I'm cooking eggs for the first time in this pan on camera, so we'll see how it goes. First up, I'm gonna try an omelet. I'm making what's called a dad garbage omelet. And what that means is I've kind of become the family goat. Whatever my son doesn't finish for breakfast, I kind of take and use as the filling for my omelet. So I get the pan heated up, in goes the butter, I wait for it to stop sizzling, and in go the eggs. I wait a few seconds and Give it a shake, and thank goodness they are not sticking. They are sliding around. I get my filling in there, flip it over with my big spatula. It really comes in handy for these type of omelets. Now this is a very heavy pan, and although I did flip the omelet, I used two hands to do it. 
and the omelet turned out delicious. Okay, for the final, final showdown, the fried egg test. I kind of feel like I've reached the boss level in a video game. Now, I've not cooked a fried egg in this pan. I'm gonna be doing it for the first time on camera, so I'm a little bit nervous. So I get the pan heated up. In goes the butter. I wait for it to stop sizzling and crackling. I gently crack an egg and pour it in. I wait about 20 seconds for it to set up, more or less. And I'm about to give it a shake. Here we go. Boom! The egg is nonstick. It released just with shaking the pan. Nailed it first try. I never had a doubt in the world. Well, maybe a few. But look at that thing slide around. Have you ever seen anything more beautiful? <laughs> Fried egg test. Okay, to me, weight is a good indication of quality. For example, ever since we got married, my wife has been steadily increasing in quality. But when it comes to this pan, when you pick it up, it is heavy. It weighs a lot. And I view that as a sign that this thing is sturdy and well-built. Um, I think the weight helps with keeping the pan stable. Um, what I mean by that is some people occasionally have trouble with carbon steel pans wobbling. They get a high spot on the bottom and the pan wobbles. Now I've cooked in this thing 15 times in addition to the initial seasoning and it is still flat as a pancake. There's no wobble whatsoever and I don't think there will be to be honest. So unless I were to dip this pan in ice water when it was hot, I don't see anything deforming this pan. Seems very well made. Okay, let's look at the handle shape. I've got carbon steel skillets from Lodge, Matfer, Movial, and another Debayer. Those handles are all flat. Thinner pieces of metal, flatter with a thumb groove in the middle. The handle on this Pro Model Debayer is more of a solid piece of stainless steel. It's a little bit wider, it's definitely thicker. And on the bottom, it has grooves for your fingers. The top does not have a thumb groove, but that doesn't seem to be any big deal to me whatsoever. Now, the handle connects to the pan with rivets. And you can see the rivets inside the pan. They're up near the lip of the pan, kind of near the top, pretty high up. Those did not affect cooking at all for me because when I cook in a pan like this, nothing is that high in the pan. Now, the helper handle. So I actually think the helper handle is indeed helpful. When I browned meat on the stovetop and moved it to the oven, whether it was the roast or the steaks, and especially getting them back out of the oven, the helper handle was indeed very helpful. So I like that. Now the only downside to the helper handle would be if you were doing a French omelet and gonna roll the omelet forward and onto a plate. This handle might get in the way just a little bit. So what you want to do there is just rotate the pan and go out the side. That's what we call a first world problem. Now a quick note on stainless steel. If you read the little booklet that came with this pan, it says you can only flash the pan in the oven for 10 minutes. That's not 100% accurate. This little booklet goes for the whole line of pans and most of the other models in this lineup have coated handles. So I got on the Debayer website and confirmed that the stainless steel handles are fine in the oven, no matter what the one little generic booklet says. So the Debayer website confirms that. Okay, let's talk about seasoning for a moment. I'm gonna reiterate and restate a technique my wife uses quite frequently. I'm gonna restate my best seasoning advice ever, and that is to get your pan initially seasoned and then just start cooking. Now some people will say you need to season these things six times in a row in the oven to get them ready to use, using flaxseed oil, which I do not like. Let's compare and contrast that to what we've done. Three days ago, this was a brand new pan. After we did the initial cleanup and initial seasoning, I've cooked in this pan 15 times. And if you add up all that cooking time for everything we've cooked and shown here in the videos, 
it's less time than one round of seasoning in the oven. So for me, you can do the oven seasoning over and over and over if you want to, but I think it's better and more legitimate and better for learning your cooking skills, better for learning your stove, better for learning your pan, to just, just cook in it. Okay, for the seasoning, I didn't use any fancy oil, no flaxseed. This all came from Crisco, canola, and vegetable oil. So you don't have to use anything fancy to get a nice dark color and good seasoning on your pan. The great thing about these carbon steel skillets is they get better every time you use them. The seasoning changes, it gets more beautiful, it cooks better. These pans get better every time you use them. Okay, I've really learned a lot over the last couple of days. The first thing is that three days of camera equipment in the kitchen drives my wife crazy, so I better wrap this thing up. The next most important thing is this is a fantastic pan. I'm gonna give it an unqualified thumbs up. This pan did a great job at cooking food. We cooked veggies, we seared meat, eggs were completely non-stick. It did a great job cooking food, and that is the most important thing. I think the build quality is exceptional. I like the, the buyer brand, they make quality products. I like the handle, I like the versatility of the stainless steel handle and that it can go from stove top to oven. I love it, I would buy another one again in a heartbeat. This is a tier one pan and I wouldn't hesitate to recommend it to anyone. Okay, if you're in a generous mood and feeling good and enjoyed the video, I'd like to ask you to please subscribe to the channel. Also, I welcome feedback. Please leave your questions or comments below the videos here on YouTube or over at the website at UncleScottsKitchen.com. I do my best to respond to each and every bit of feedback I receive. As long as it's nothing too ridiculous, we are on the internet after all. And what else? If you're looking for one of these pans, also make sure you check out our shopping links below. Thank you for watching Uncle Scott's Kitchen, and we'll see you next time. Fire Mineral B Element Professional Model is an excellent, excellent pan. I give it an uncut. Hey, bud, I'm taping something, man. Yes, it is. Go get your juice. Please go get your juice. Come here. Come here. <laughs> What, what's this? What's that? Pick up truck. Pick up truck. That pick up truck. That's a white pickup truck. Is that pick up truck? It is a pickup.